In this video, we're going to start to learn about hypothesis testing, the process of doing inferential statistics. This video is going to be part one of a four-part mini-series, all focused on hypothesis testing. And we're going to focus today on sort of some foundational concepts first, and then we're going to talk about stage one, sort of the first phase of hypothesis testing, which is forming your statistical hypotheses. So starting with the very basics, like I said, what is a hypothesis? Simply put, a hypothesis is an educated guess about the world, and this is what we want to test. We want to test our hypotheses about the world. So hypothesis testing, then, is this process. It's the process of testing your hypotheses. Now, how we do this is by using sample data to answer questions about the population, to make inferences about populations using, again, inferential statistics. So it would look something like this. Let's say you're interested in a population parameter. You want to estimate, for example, or approximate, or make a best guess about what a population mean is, mu. Well, the way we do this is by collecting a sample and getting a sample mean, x bar. In that case, x bar is our best guess about what mu is. Now, we're never going to be quite perfect in, you know, this best guess about mu, and this is where sampling error comes in. Sampling error is simply the difference between the sample statistic, in this case x bar, and the population parameter, mu, that the sample statistic is designed to approximate or to estimate. Now, we uh, basically show sampling error as its own little symbol here, which is called epsilon. So you're going to see that several times in this video, and you'll probably see it more in the future too, because it's an important concept. Whenever we're doing research, sampling error is at play. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you did something wrong. Sure, error on the part of the researcher is one possible source of sampling error, but it could mean lots of different things. If I wanted to approximate intelligence among a certain group, for example, there are all sorts of factors that would basically cause what I observe to be different than how intelligent they really are. Maybe this person stayed up really late the night before, or they didn't have their coffee this morning, or whatever. This is going to cause differences again, from what I observe to how intelligent they really are, which is a source of sampling error. And no matter what study you're doing, sampling error will be at play. So keep this in mind because we will come back to this a little bit later in the video. So this leads me to introducing the four stages of hypothesis testing. Now, we're only going to focus on the first in this video, but again, you're going to see all four, and understanding all four is going to be really important in order to fully understand how inferential statistics works. So first, you form your statistical hypotheses. We'll get to this in just a moment. In our next video, we'll talk about making predictions about those hypotheses and establishing a standard of evidence. One of the, I think, more conceptually challenging concepts here, um, but nonetheless really, really important for understanding this. Then we're going to talk about actually doing the statistics, right? Collecting your data and doing hypothesis tests. And finally, we're going to talk in our last video uh, in this mini-series about evaluating your hypotheses in light of evidence. So let's start with forming your statistical hypotheses. And I'm going to start with an example. Here's this supplement out there. It's called NeuroIQ. It is not FDA approved. It makes no specific claims. You can see it kind of lists memory concentration and focus here. It doesn't say that it necessarily improves those things. It just mentioned, mentions those things there. Uh, you'll also see it doesn't make any claims about IQ, but it is very suggestive that it should improve your IQ. So here's my question as a researcher. Does this supplement, NeuroIQ, actually change people's IQ? So I'm going to design a study to test this question, and this is the study we're going to roll with as our example throughout the next three videos in addition to this one. So in the population, we know that IQ scores are normally distributed with a population mean of 100, that's average, and a standard deviation of 15. Now, if I wanted to test the question on the previous slide, the best way to do it would be to give neural IQ to every single person in the population and then measure every single person's IQ and see if that new population IQ is different than what it used to be. Obviously, this is extremely unrealistic. There's no way we could take everyone in the world and give them this supplement and measure their IQ. It's just purely unreasonable to even think that's a possibility. So instead, what we do is we collect a sample. So let's say I did this study, and I kept it reasonable. I just collected 15 participants, let's say. I gave them neural IQ for 30 days, and then I measured their IQ at the end of that 30-day period. And here's the data I collected. So n, my sample size is 15. Here's their actual IQ scores of all 15 people at the end of the 30-day period of taking neuro IQ, and here's my sample statistics. 
so x bar my sample mean is 105.9 and my standard deviation of the sample is 15.1. So you can see there's a 5.9 point difference in this sample's IQ from the population's IQ. But the question is, is this difference of 5.9 points meaningful? Is it enough for me to be convinced that neuro IQ is actually effective in changing people's IQ scores? Well, this is where two possibilities come into play. First of all, it's possible that there is no effect of neuro IQ on IQ scores, and the 5.9 point increase that we observed in our sample is due only to sampling error, epsilon. A second possibility is that neuro IQ actually is effective in changing people's IQ scores. There is a real effect. So in this case, we can represent that by tau, this symbol here meaning real effect, plus epsilon. Notice that we still have sampling error. This is important to understand because even if there is a real effect in the population and we're successfully picking up on that real effect, it doesn't mean that we're going to necessarily measure that real effect perfectly. It could be the case, for example, that neuro IQ actually improves people's IQ points by, let's say, three points, but we observed kind of a 5.9 point difference. So there's still some sampling error there. We're still off a little bit, but we're nonetheless picking up on a real effect. So tau plus epsilon. And these two possibilities map on really well to our two statistical hypotheses, which we call the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. So let's start with the null. The null hypothesis states that in the population, there's no change, no difference, no relationship, and essentially no effect. The null states there's nothing going on, and more specifically it states that any difference we do see in our sample is due only to sampling error, epsilon, and it's not actually due to any real effects in the population. So that's the null. The alternative is just the opposite. The alternative states that in the population, there is a change, a difference, a relationship, or more broadly, an effect. And we can kind of symbolically identify the alternative as follows, tau plus epsilon, as we saw before, a real effect and sampling error still operating. You'll notice, by the way, we kind of notate the null by h sub 0 and the alternative by h sub 1. The subscript here basically means, is there an effect or not? So the hypothesis of no effect, 0, no effect, or the hypothesis of 1, yes, there is an effect. So we can kind of say that like this then. The null says no real effect exists. The alternative says a real effect does exist. And there's a reason we frame our hypotheses this way. It's really important to have the two flip sides because these two hypotheses taken together are mutually exclusive and exhaustive. Mutually exclusive meaning one of these hypotheses can be true. It can't be both, right? It's either one or the other. And exhaustive meaning that these two hypotheses together cover all possibilities. So one of these hypotheses must be true in the world. Either no real effect exists or there is a real effect. There's no third option and it can't be both. And this is really important because since these two hypotheses are mutually exclusive and exhaustive in this way, we know that discrediting one of these explanations gives us reason to believe the other one. If, for example, we were able to discredit the null, and we were able to say that the null is false, that we're reasonably confident that it is false that there is no effect, this is the same as saying we're pretty confident that the alternative is true, that there is a real effect. And this is what we do in science. We're always seeking to falsify. We're never trying to prove. We're always trying to disprove because it's much easier to do. It's almost impossible to actually prove something, but it's very easy to disprove something. And so this is our setup. We're always seeking to either reject the null hypothesis, which would be evidence for the alternative, or we fail to reject the null hypothesis, in which case that's kind of evidence against the alternative. And as you'll see pretty soon, the reason we go with the null is because the null is much more specific and therefore much easier to disprove compared to the alternative. And again, you're going to see that in a few slides. So let's get more specific. The null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis in its sort of general form would look something like this. You'll notice, first of all, that we're looking at population parameters here. Our statistical hypotheses are framed in terms of populations because that's what we're interested in. That's what we're trying to make conclusions about. We're using sample data to make those conclusions, but ultimately our hypotheses and our conclusions are about populations. So that's what goes into our statistical hypotheses. So the null would look something like this. The mean that you would find after giving people this treatment would be equal to the mean you find for people who don't take that treatment. 
this is a, you know, kind of fancy roundabout way of mathematically stating what we're talking about here. The null meaning no effect. Giving people this treatment will not change the mean if you didn't give them the treatment at all. The alternative says, well, the mean of people who take, you know, this supplement or whatever will be different than the mean of people who don't take this supplement, which is to say we're finding an effect. There is a difference on the basis of taking this supplement. So going back to our experiment, here's how we would state our statistical hypotheses. So the null hypothesis would say the mean of people who take NeuroIQ will be equal to 100, which is just the mean without treatment. That's the average IQ score in the population. So this is the same as saying, again, no effect. Neuro IQ will not make a difference on your IQ scores. And the alternative just states the opposite. The mean of people who take Neuro IQ will be different than 100. We will make a change from average. So that's forming our statistical hypotheses, the null and the alternative. And in our next video, we're going to learn how to make predictions and establish our standard of evidence to determine what we need to find in order to be convinced that there actually is an effect or not.